There are many things that we can do to reduce the environmental impact of our products and services. One of these is to use less. Due to increases in technology and efficiency, products and services decrease in material content, so subsequent releases of new products tend to use less material than earlier versions. This concept can be easily illustrated by using the development of computers over time and over the years. When computers were first invented, they filled entire rooms. Over time, computers have dematerialized into desktop PCs and then smaller still laptops, netbooks and now handheld multimedia devices such as personal digital assistants and smartphones. Similarly, in the case of audio equipment, music players have evolved from large gramophones to record players um, to smaller still cassettes, mini discs and compact discs and now to invisible MP3 digital music files. In an interesting research study, Hodge and Jackson investigated whether the use of digital media entails a reduction in materials use by analysing the combined impacts of such media, associated hardware and consumer responses. Although on the face of it they agreed that the units of music media were actually decreasing in size, for example dematerialising, they actually noted that the hardware to play digital media still requires a huge hidden infrastructure of computer services, internet provider in infrastructure, as well as the computers themselves to play the digital files. This highlights the case that dematerialization may not always be as straightforward as it seems. Another less technology-oriented example of dematerialization comes from the beer manufacturer Grosch. The design team at Grosch worked with EnviroWise to look at the materials content of their bottles. They undertook a number of redesigns of their beer bottles in order to reduce the amount of material and weight in the packaging, therefore reducing transport and material costs. Each iteration of the packaging resulted in a percentage decrease in the weight of packaging, therefore dematerializing it over time. Due to tightening regulations surrounding the packaging of products, an increased focus on producer responsibility, designers and manufacturers are increasingly turning to packaging as a way of reducing their environmental impact. There are several ways that this has been done, either by reducing the packaging in which the supplier sends a product to the client, or by reducing the amount of packaging that the consumer actually takes home. Providing the consumer with a refill option as opposed to enforcing the purchase of a brand new product has also emerged as a popular way of reducing packaging volume and material content. As this slide shows, the Cadbury Treasure Eggs were a product that was launched in 2008 which eliminated the use of the cardboard box and plastic insert that is usually associated with Easter eggs. By doing this, Cadbury managed to reduce their plastic use by 78% and their cardboard use by 65% when compared to a standard Easter egg. Considering the, so consideration sorry, needs to be given, however, to the transportation of the Easter egg and whether or not consumers feel that they could safely transport the egg home in amongst the rest of their shopping. Although this is a one-off product, Cadbury have managed to reduce their overall use of plastic casing and cardboard packaging significantly across their whole range of Easter eggs um, since this product was launched. Designers can also create products that minimise the amount of materials or minimise the amount of components used. So, for example, when razors were first designed, for some reason they used a significant amount of components made from a variety of plastics and metals, and they were obviously, or sorry, often permanently fixed together with industrial glues. Over time, designers have worked at reducing the amount of components in fast-moving commercial goods, such as razors, and have made them so that they can be taken apart more easily at the end of life, or indeed reusable by replacing the blade. Products are increasingly being manufactured for ease of deconstruction at the end of their life, for more straightforward disposal, and to make sure that the right materials find their way into the correct recycling streams. This chair, for example, has been designed with 96% of recyclable parts, and just 4% of non-recyclable parts. Design for deconstruction does put a certain amount of responsibility on the consumer. In the case of this chair, for example, it's been designed assuming that at the end of its life, the owner will deconstruct it 
and make sure that all of the parts are recycled in the correct manner. This to me is slightly optimistic and so with products such as this you will often find that they work better if accompanied by some kind of take back scheme where the customer is given the incentive to return the product to the shop or manufacturer at the end of its life. This is a more complex system as it moves from being about the design of a single product to the design of a product service system. <coughs> Designers have started to think about how they design for the end of life, with the consumer very much in mind. Everyday tins and pots, for example, used to be designed with a label that was very difficult to remove in a clean and easy way. Therefore, it was difficult for the product to find its way into a single recycling stream. Designers should consider how easy a simple product is to deconstruct for the purpose of recycling, otherwise the product is likely to end up in landfill. Recycling a product still requires a substantial amount of resources and energy use, and so creating a product that can be reused is a significantly better option. This wine carrier has been designed so that once it has been used to transport the wine home, the consumer can then refigure the wooden parts to create a wine rack that can be expanded upon uh, over time. With concepts such as this, the designer has to be careful to consider the target market for the product to ensure that the product ends up being used as intended. For example, if the wrong consumer bought this product, then the intended wine rack could well end up being disposed of, which ultimately would be more environmental damaging than if the wine was bought and taken home in the usual manner using a plastic bag, for example. Organisations have started to take responsibility for the reuse of products or component parts themselves, which limits the risk of unintended use. Kodak have designed their disposable cameras to be returned by the customer and disassembled. They then make sure that all of the valuable parts in the product are reused or refurbished, and then reused within new cameras, and that all of the disposable parts are recycled in the correct way. Design for sustainable behaviour is an emerging activity which aims to reduce the environmental and social impacts of products by moderating users' interaction with them. In this example, the EcoPlug encourages the user to set a timer to enforce the time limit of the use of a product therefore encouraging the user to think more carefully about the amount of energy they're consuming. A product as simple as this can create significant savings when used in the home or in fact commercially. For example, vending machines are often left on all of the time using unnecessary energy to cool packets of crisps and fizzy drinks. So a low cost product such as this could save up to 16 hours of energy use a day. Designers are also able to create products that incentivize customers to behave in a more sustainable way. For example, the Eco Kettle on this slide looks like a regular kettle, but has a special feature that allows the user to fill the kettle to its maximum, but then allows them to boil one to eight cups according to their requirements. Therefore, the user has to consider how much water and subsequent energy that they need each time they use the kettle. This is a subtle but effective way of giving the consumer feedback and choice about their consumption patterns. There is a significant difference between the intended lifespan of a product depending on, upon its quality and intended audience. For example, a sofa could be made using low-cost materials and manufacturing techniques because it is intended to furnish a student house, for example, and is only intended to be used for a short amount of time. However, a sofa could also be de designed to last a lifetime and to even age gracefully and look better over the years. We have to be careful when thinking about technological products in the same way. For example, my grandma might be proud that she still uses the same washing machine that she bought 50 years ago. But in reality, that washing machine is probably hugely inefficient, costing her far too much in energy prices and in having a significantly higher impact on the environment than a newer model. The same can be said for cars as we are increasingly producing more and more efficient models, but this carbon saving has to be weighed up against the environmental cost of manufacturing. Designers are increasingly creating products to use renewable energy. On this slide is an example of a solar-powered traffic light which can be found in South Africa. 
and also a wind-powered car that was featured on Top Gear, although I'm not sure that you'll see any of these uh, cars on the M25 anytime soon.